The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so let's continue uh, talking about maximum likelihood estimation in the context of generalized linear models. All right, so in those generalized linear models, what we spend uh, most of the past lectures uh, working on is the conditional distribution of y, sorry, of y given x. And we're gonna assume that this uh, follows some uh, distribution in the exponential family. Okay, and so what it means is that if I look at the, uh, the density, say, or the PMF, but uh, uh, you, let's talk about density to make things clear, we're gonna assume that uh, y given f, has x has di distribution, so x is now fixed because we're conditioning on it, and has a density which is of this form. C of y i phi. Okay, so the C, again, we don't really need to think about it. This is something that's gonna come out naturally as soon as you need a uh, normalization factor. And so here what it means, so if this is the distribution of y given xi, so that's the density of y i given xi is equal to little xi. So if it's the conditional distribution of y i given xi, it should depend on xi somehow, and it does not appear to depend on xi, and here the model is gonna be on theta i, which is just a function theta i of xi, and we're gonna take a very specific one, it's gonna be a function of a linear, uh, 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 a linear uh, um, form of the xi, so really we're gonna take something which is of the form theta i, which is really just a theta, does not depend on xi, of xi transpose some beta, okay? So all these parts here, this is really some modeling assumptions that we're making once we've agreed on what distribution we want. Okay, so to do that, so, our goal, of course, is going to try to understand what this beta is. There's one beta here. What's important is that this beta does not depend on i. So if I observe pairs x i, y i, let's say I observe n of them, i equals one to n, the hope is that as I accumulate more and more pairs of this form, where there's always the same parameter that links xi to yi, that's this parameter beta, then I should have a better and better estimation of this beta because it's always the same and that's essentially what couples all of our distribution. If I did not assume this, then I could have a different distribution for each pair xi given yi and I would not be able to do any statistics. There would nothing, nothing would average in the end. But here I have the same beta, which means that I can hope to do statistics and average errors out. Okay, so I'm gonna collect, so uh, I'll come back to this, so, but as usual in the linear regression model, we're gonna collect all our observations yi, so here I'm gonna assume that they're real valued, and that my xi val takes value in rp, just like in the regression model, and I'm gonna collect all my yi's into bi one big vector of y in rn, and all my x's into one big matrix in rn times p. Okay, just like for the linear regression model. All right, so again, what I'm interested in here is the conditional distribution of yi given xi. Okay, and I said this is this distribution. When we're talking about regression, I defined last time what the definition of, of, of a regression function was. It's just one particular aspect of this conditional distribution is the conditional expectation of yi given xi. Okay, and so this conditional expectation I will denote it by so if I talk about the conditional so 
that's, I'm going to call it the new i, which is the conditional expectation of yi given xi equals some little xi, say. You can forget about this part if you find it confusing. It really doesn't matter. It's just so that this is just, this means that this is a function of little xi. But if I only had expectation of yi given big xi, this would be just a function of big xi. Right, so it really doesn't change anything. It's just a matter of notation. Okay, so just uh, forget about this part, but uh, I'll just uh, do it like that here. Okay, so this is just the conditional expectation of yi given xi. All right, it just depends on xi, so I'll particularly depends on i, and so I will call it mu i. But I know that since I'm in a canonical exponential family, then I know that mu i is actually b prime of theta i. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one link between the canonical parameter of my exponential family and the mean mu i, the conditional expectation. And the modeling assumption we're going to make is not directly, that's, we remember that was the second aspect of the generalized linear model. We're not going to assume that theta i itself directly depends on xi. We're going to assume that mu i has a particular dependence on xi through the link function. All right, so again, we're back to modeling. So we have a link function g. And we assume that mu i depends on x i as follows. G of mu i, and remember g, all g does for us is really map the space in which mu i lives, which could be just the interval 0, 1 to the entire real line, all right? And we're going to assume that this thing that lives in the real line is just xi transpose beta. I should maybe put a small one, xi transpose beta, okay? So we're making indeed some modeling assumption, but compared to uh, in the linear regression model, we only assume that mu i was xi transpose beta. So if you want to cr make a parallel between generalized linear models and linear model, it's just the, f the only difference is that g is not the identity necessarily in this case. And all that g does for us is to just make this thing compatible, that those two things on the left and the right of this equality live in the same space. So in a way, we're not making a much, you know, bigger leap of faith uh, uh, by assuming a linear model. The linear link is already here. We're just making things compatible. All right. And so uh, this is going to be uh, what, uh, so it's always the same link function. So now if I want to uh, go back to uh, beta, right, because I'm going to want to express my likelihood so if I were to express my likelihood from this, it would just be a function of theta, right? And so if I want to maximize my likelihood, I don't want to maximize it in theta, I want to maximize it in beta. So if I can write my density as a function of beta, then I will be able to write my likelihood as a function of beta and then talk about my maximum likelihood estimator. And so all I need to do is to just say, okay, how do I replace theta by, what is, I know that theta is a function of beta, right? I wrote it here. So the question is, what, what is this function? And I actually have access to all of this. So what I know is that theta, right? So mu is b prime of theta, which means that theta i is b prime inverse of mu i. OK? So that's what we got from this you know, derivative of the log likelihood equal to 0 uh, that gave us this guy. I inverted it. And now I know that mu i is g inverse of xi beta. So this composition of B prime inverse and G inverse is actually just the composition of G with B prime. Everybody's comfortable with this notation, the little circle? Any question about this? All right, just means that I first apply B prime. Well, actually it's the inverse, but if I look at a function G composed with B prime, I first apply G. So g b prime of x is just g of b prime of x. OK, and then I take the inverse of this function, which is first take g inverse and then take b prime inverse. 
Okay, so now I have everywhere I saw theta, now I see this function of beta. So I could technically plug that in. Of course, it's a little painful to have to write G circle beta prime all the time. So I'm gonna give this guy a name. And uh, so you're just gonna define H, which is G B prime inverse so that theta i is simply h of xi transpose beta. Okay, I could give it a name, you know, let's call, but let's just call it, I don't know, the h function. So there's something which is nice about this h function is that if g is the canonical link, what is the canonical link? Right, so it's, what is it canonical to? A canonical link is canonical to a particular distribution in the exp canonical exponential family, right? A canonical exponential family is completely characterized by the function d, which means that if I wanna talk about the canonical link, all I need to tell you is how it depends on b. So what is g as a function of b? B inverse, B prime inverse, right? So this is G is equal to B prime inverse, which means that if G is composed with B prime, that means that this is just the identity. So H is the identity. So H of Xi transpose beta is simply Xi transpose beta. And it's true that the way we introduced the canonical link was just the function for which we model directly theta I as Xi transpose beta, right? Which is, we can read off here, right? So theta I is simply Xi transpose beta. So now for example, if I go back to this, uh, to my uh, log likelihood, uh, which I know, so if I go back to my log likelihood, right? So if I look log likelihood, so the log likelihood is sum of the log of the densities. So it's sum from i equal one to n of log of exponential y i theta i minus b theta i divided by phi plus c of yi phi, all right? So this term that does not depend on theta. So I have two things. First of all, the log and the, exp and the uh, exponential are gonna cancel each other. And second, I actually know that theta is just a function of beta and it has this form. Theta i is h of xi transpose beta. And that's my modeling assumption. So this is actually equal to the sum from i equal one to n of y i, and then here I'm gonna write h of x i transpose beta minus b of h of x i transpose beta divided by phi. And then I have again this function c of y i phi, which again won't matter because when I'm gonna try to maximize this thing, this is just playing the role of a constant that's shifting the entire function. So in particular, the org max is gonna be exactly what it was, okay? So this thing is really not gonna matter for me. I'm keeping track of it. And actually, if you look here, it's gone, right? It's gone because it does not matter. So let's just pretend it's not here because it won't matter when I'm trying to maximize the likelihood, okay? Well, it's here up to a constant term, let's say. That's the constant term. All right, any question? All I'm doing here is replacing my likelihood as a function of theta i's. So if I had one theta i per observation, again, this would not help me very much. But if I assume that they're all linked together by saying that theta i is of the form xi transpose beta, or h of xi transpose beta if I'm not using the, can the canonical link, then I can hope to make some estimation. 
right? So again, if I, I have the canonical link, H is the identity, so I'm left only with yi times xi transpose beta, and then I have b of xi transpose beta, not b composed with h, because h is the identity, which is fairly simple, right? Why is it simple? Well, let's actually focus on this guy for one second. Uh, so let me write it down so we know what we're talking about. So we just showed that the log likelihood when I use the canonical link so that h is equal to the identity, the log likelihood actually takes the form ln, and it depends on a bunch of stuff, but let's just make it depend only on the parameter that we care about, which is beta, all right? So this is of the form L of beta, and that's equal to what is the sum from i equal one to n of yi xi transpose beta minus, let me put the phi here, and then I'm gonna have minus b of xi transpose beta. Okay, and phi we know is uh, some known positive term, so again, optimizing a function plus some constant or optimizing a function times a constant, that's not gonna change much either. So it won't really matter to think about whether this phi is here or not. But let's just think about what this function looks like, all right? I'm trying to maximize a function. I'm trying to maximize the log likelihood. If it looked like this, that would be a serious problem. But we can do like a basic, you know, back of the envelope uh, uh, guess of what the variations of this function is. This first term here is, uh, in, as a function of beta, it's, what kind of function is it? Linear. It's linear, right? This is just xi transpose beta. If I multiply beta by two, I get twice. If I add something to beta, it just gets added. So it's a linear function of beta. And so this thing is both convex and concave. In the one dimensional case, so think about p as being one dimensional, so that beta is a one dimensional thing. Those are just the function that look like this, right? Those are linear functions. They are both convex and concave. So, this is not gonna matter when it comes to the convexity of my overall function because I'm just adding something which is just a line. And so if I started with convex, it's gonna stay convex. If I started with concave, it's gonna stay concave. And if I started with something which is both, it's gonna stay both, meaning neither. It cannot be both, ah, yeah. So if you're neither convex or concave, adding this linear. So this will not really matter. So if I want to understand what my function looks like, I need to understand what B of xi transpose beta does. Again, the xi transpose beta no impact, it's a linear function. In terms of convexity, it's not gonna play any role. So I really need to understand what my function b looks like. What do we know about b again? So we know that b prime of theta is equal to mu, right? Well, you know, the mean of, um, of a random variable in the canonical exponential family can be a positive or a negative number. This really does not tell me anything. That can be really anything. However, if I look at the second derivative of, uh, of b, I know that this is what? This is the variance of uh, y divided by phi, right? That was my dispersion parameter. The variance was equal to phi times b prime prime. So we know that if theta is not degenerate, meaning that you know, the density does not take value infinity at only one point, this thing is actually positive. And clearly when you have something that looks like this, and unless you have some crazy stuff happening with phi being equal to zero or anything that's not normal, then you will see that you're not degenerate. So you, this thing is strictly positive. And we've said several times that if b prime prime is positive, then that means that you know, that's the derivative of b prime, meaning that b prime is increasing and uh, b prime is increasing is just the same thing as saying that b is convex, right? So that implies that b is strictly convex. And the strictly means, comes from the fact that this is a strict sign. Well, I should not do that because now it's no longer. All right, so it's just a strict sign, meaning that the function, this is not strictly convex because it's linear. Strictly convex means there's always some curvature everywhere. So now I have this thing that's linear minus something that's convex. Something that's negative, something convex is concave. 
So this thing is linear plus concave, so it is concave. So I know, just by looking at this, that ln of beta, which of course is something that lives in Rp, but if I saw it living in R1, it would look like this, and if I saw it living in R2, it would look like a dome, like this. And it, the fact that it's tricked is also telling me that there's actually a unique ma maximizer. So there's a unique maximizer in Xi transpose beta, but not in beta necessarily. We're gonna need extra assumptions for this. Okay, so this is what I say here. The log likelihood is strictly concave. And so as a consequence, under extra assumptions on the Xi's, because of course if the Xi's are not, uh, if the Xi's are all the same, right? So that like if the entries of Xi's, so if Xi is equal to one, 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 then Xi transpose beta is just the sum of the betas. And I will be of the beta i's, I will be strictly concave in those guys, but certainly not in the individual entries. Okay, so I need extra thing on my Xi so that this happens just like we needed the matrix capital X in the linear regression case to be a full rank. So we could actually identify what beta was. Okay, it's gonna be exactly the same thing. So, uh, uh, so here, this is when we have this very specific uh, uh, parameterization, and the question is, uh, uh, but it might not be the case if we change the parameter beta into something else, okay? So here, the fact that we use the canonical link and et cetera, everything actually works really to our advantage, all right? So that everything becomes strictly concave and we know exactly what's happening. All right, so I understand I went a bit fast on playing with convex and concave function. This is not the purpose. Uh, you know, I could spend a lecture telling you, oh, if I add two concave functions, then the result remains concave. If I had a, you know, concave and a strictly concave, then the result still remains strictly concave, and we could spend time proving this. This is, was just for you to get an intuition as to why this is correct, but we don't really have time to go into too much details. One thing you can do, a strictly concave function, if it's in one dimension, all I need to have is that the second derivative is strictly, is strictly negative, right? That's a strictly concave function. That was the analytic definition we had for strict con concavity. So if this was in one dimension, it would look like this. Yi times xi times beta. Now beta is just one number. And then I would have minus beta xi times uh, b, and this is over, all over phi. You take second derivatives, the fact that this is linear in beta, this is gonna go away. And here I'm just gonna be left with minus, so if I take the second derivative with respect to beta, this is gonna be equal to minus b prime prime xi beta times xi squared divided by phi. So this is clearly positive. That's, that's where, if xi is zero, this is degenerate, so I would not get it. Uh, then I have the second derivative of V prime, which I know is positive because of the variance thing that I have here divided by phi. And so that would all be fine. But for one dimension, if I wanted to do this in higher dimensions, I would have to say that the Hessian is a positive definite matrix. And that's maybe a bit beyond uh, what this was. Okay. So in the rest of this chapter, uh, I will do what I did not do uh, when we talked about maximum likelihood. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually show how to do this maximization, right? So here we know that the function is concave, but what it looks like specifically depends on what B is. And for different Bs, I'm gonna have different things to do. Just like when I was talking about maximum likelihood estimation, if I had a concave uh, log likelihood function, I could optimize it, but depending on what the function is, I would actually need some algorithms that's maybe working better on some functions than others. Now here, I don't have random things. I have the B is the cumulant generating function of a canonical exponential family, and there is a way for me to sort of leverage that, all right? So not only is the, there's the, the B part, but there's also the linear part. And if I start trying to use that, I'm actually gonna be able to devise very specific optimization algorithm. And the way I'm gonna be able to do this is by thinking of simple black box optimization to which I can actually technically feed any function, but it's gonna turn out that the iterations of this iterative algorithms are gonna look very familiar 
uh, when, we, uh, when we just plug in the particular values of B of the log likelihood that we have for this problem. And so the three methods we're gonna talk about going from more black box, meaning you can basically stuff at any function, it's gonna work, any concave function is gonna work, all the way to this is working specifically for generalized linear model, are Newton-Raphson method. Who's already heard about the Newton-Raphson method? Right, so, you know, any, that's probably, some people actually learn this algorithm without even knowing the word algorithm, right? It's a function that, I mean, typically it's supposed to be finding roots of functions, but finding the root of a function of a derivative is the same as finding the minimum of a function. Uh, so uh, that's the first black box method. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty old. And then there's something that's very specific to what we're doing, which is called, uh, so this newton raphson method is gonna involve the Hessian of our uh, log likelihood. And uh, since we know something about the Hessian for a particular problem, we're gonna be able to move on to Fisher scoring. And the word Fisher here is actually exactly coming from Fisher information. So the Hessian is gonna involve the Fisher information. And uh, finally, uh, we will talk about iteratively reweighted least squares. And that's not for any function. It's really when we're trying to use the fact that there is this linear dependence on the xi's. And this is essentially gonna tell us, well, you know, you can use least squares for linear regression. Here you can use least squares, but locally, and you have to iterate, okay? And uh, this last part is essentially a trick by statisticians to be able to solve the newton raphson updates without actually uh, having a dedicated software for this, but just being able to reuse some least squares uh, software. Okay, so, you know, uh, we've talked about this many times. I just wanna make sure that uh, we're all on the same page here. Uh, we have a function f, we're gonna assume that it has two derivatives and it's a function from rm to r. So its first derivative is called gradient. That's just the vector that collects all the partial derivatives with respect to each of the coordinates. It's dimension m, of course. And the second derivative is an m by m matrix. It's called the Hessian. And uh, on, the I -J, on the ith row and jth column, you see the second partial derivative with respect to the ith component and the jth component, okay? We've seen that several times. This is just not variable calculus. Uh, but uh, really the point here is to, uh, s maybe the notation is slightly different because I want to keep track of f. So when I write gradient, I write nabla sub f, and, and when I write Hessian, I write nabla sub uh, h sub f. And if, as I said, if f is strictly concave, then h f of x is negative definite. What it means is that if I take any x in Rm, then x transpose hf, uh, well, that's for any x0, x, this is actually strictly negative. That's what it means to be negative definite, okay? So every time I do x transpose, so if I have, so th this is like a quadratic form and I want it to be negative for all values of x0 and x, both of them. That's very strong, clearly. Uh, but for us, actually, this is what happens just because of the properties of b. Uh, well, at least uh, the fact that it's a n negative, less than or equal to, uh, if I want it to be strictly less, I need some properties on x. And then I, I will call the Hessian map, the function that maps x to this matrix hf of x. Okay, so that's just the second derivative at, at x, yeah. Uh, where do I say smooth? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you need to be able to apply Schwarz lemma. Let's say a, a true continuous derivative that's smooth. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so how does the newton raphson uh, method work? Well, what it does is that it forms a quadratic approximation to your function, and that's the one it optimizes at every single point, okay? And the reason is because we have a closed form solution to defining the minimum of a quadratic function. So if I give you a function that's of the form ax squared plus b uh, x plus c, you know exactly a closed form for its minimum. And But if I give you any function, or let's say, a, yeah, yeah, so here it's all about maxima, I'm sorry. I'm gonna try to, if you're confused with the, me using the word minimum, just assume that it was the word maximum. 
Um, so this is how it works, okay? If I give you a function which is concave, and that's quadratic, okay? So it's gonna look like this. All right, so that's of the form ax squared, where a is negative, of course, plus bx plus c. Then, you know, you can solve your uh, whatever. You can take the derivative of this guy, set it equal to zero, and you will have an exact equation into what the value of x is that realizes this maximum. If I give you any function that's concave, that's not clear, right? I mean, you know, if I tell you the function that we have here is of the form ax minus b of x, right? Then I'm just gonna have something that inverts uh, b prime, but you know, how do I do it exactly? It's not clear. And so what we do is we do a quadratic approximation, which should be true approximately everywhere, right? So if I'm at this point here, I'm gonna say, oh, I'm close to being that function. And if I'm at this point here, I'm gonna be close to being that function. And for this functions, I can actually optimize. And so if I'm not moving too far from one to the other, I should actually get something. So here's how the quadratic approximation works. I'm gonna write the second order Taylor expansion. Okay, and so that's just gonna be my quadratic approximation. It's gonna say, oh, f of x, when x is close to some point x zero, is gonna be close to f of x zero plus the gradient of f at x zero transpose x minus x zero. And then I'm gonna have plus one half x minus x zero transpose hf at x zero x minus x transpose, right? Uh, x minus x zero. So that's just my second order Taylor expansion multivariate one. And that's, let's say if x zero is this guy. Now, what I'm gonna do is say, okay, if I wanted to set this derivative of this guy equal to zero, I would just have to solve, well, you know, f prime of x equals zero, meaning that x has to be f prime inverse of zero. And really, apart from like being some notation manipulations, this is really not helping me, okay? Because I don't know what f prime inverse of zero is in many instances. However, if f has a very specific form, which is something that depends on x in a very specific way, there's just a linear term and then a quadratic term, then I can actually do something. All right, so let's forget about this approach. And rather than minimizing f, let's just minimize the right-hand side. Okay, so, sorry, maximize. So maximize the right-hand side. And so how do I get this? Well, I just set the gradient equal to zero. So what is the gradient? The first term does not uh, depend on x, okay? So that means that uh, this is gonna be zero plus, what is the gradient of this thing? Of uh, the gradient of f at x zero transpose x minus x zero? What is the gradient of this guy? So I have a function of the form b transpose x. What is the gradient of this thing? I'm sorry? I, I'm writing everything into column form, right? So it's just b, okay? So here, what is b? Well, it's uh, gradient of f at x zero. Okay, and this term here, gradient of f at x zero transpose x zero is just a constant. This thing is going away as well. And then I'm looking at the derivative of this guy here. And this is like a quadratic term. It's like h times x minus x zero squared. So when I'm gonna take the derivative, I'm gonna have a factor two that's gonna pop out and cancel this one half. And then I'm gonna be left only with this part times this part. Okay, so that's plus hf x minus x zero. Okay, so that's just the uh, gradient and I want it to be equal to zero, so I'm just gonna solve this equal to zero. Okay? So that means that if I want to find the minimum, this is just gonna be the x star that satisfies this, so that's actually equivalent to hf times x star is equal to um, hf 
x0 minus gradient f at x0. Now, this is a much easier thing to solve. What is this? This is just a system of linear equations, right? I just need to find the x star such that when I pre-multiply it by a matrix, I get this vector on the right-hand side. This is just the something of the form ax equals b, and I have many ways I can do this. I could do Gaussian elimination, or I could use, you know, Spielman's uh, fast uh, Laplacian solvers if I had some particular properties of uh, h. I mean, there's huge activity in terms of how to solve those systems. But let's say I don't, I have some time, it's not a huge problem. I can actually just use linear algebra and linear algebra just tells me that x star is equal to hf inverse times this guy. Which those two guys are gonna cancel. So this is actually equal to x zero minus hf inverse gradient f at x zero. And that's just what's called a Newton iterations. I started at some x zero. I'm at some x zero where I make my approximation and it's telling me if I, starting from this x zero, I wanted to fully optimize the quadratic approximation, I would just have to take the x star that's this guy. And then I could just use this guy as my x zero and do it again and again and again and again. And those are called Newton iterations and they're basically the working horse, the workhorse of, of uh, you know, interior point methods, for example, or a lot of optimization algorithms. And that's what you can, you see here, x star is equal to x zero minus the inverse Hessian times the gradient. We briefly mentioned gradient descent. We briefly mentioned gradient descent, right? At some point to optimize the convex function, right? And if I wanted to use gradient descent, again, h, is a matrix, but if I wanted to think of H as being a scalar, would it be a positive or a negative number? Yeah. Why? Yeah, so that would be this. So I want to move against the gradient to do what? To minimize, but I'm maximizing here, right? Everything is maximized, right? So I know that h is actually negative definite, so it's a negative number, okay? So that's, you're making the same, uh, uh, you have the same confusion as I do. We're maximizing a concave function here. So h is negative. So this is something of the form x zero plus something times the gradient. And this is what your gradient ascent rather than descent would look like. And all it's saying, Newton is telling you don't take the gradient for granted as a direction in which you want to go. It says, do a slight change of coordinates before you do this according to what your Hessian looks like. All right, and that's what, uh, th those are called second order methods that require knowing what the Hessian is, but uh, those are actually much more powerful than the gradient descent because they're using all of the local geometry of the problem. All of the local geometry of your function is completely encoded in this Hessian. And in particular, it implies that it tells you where to switch and not uh, go slower in some places or go faster in other places. Now, this in practice for say, modern large scale machine learning problems, inverting this matrix H is extremely painful. It's, it takes too much time, the matrix is too big and computers cannot do it. And people resort to what's called uh, pseudo uh, Newton methods, which essentially try to emulate what this guy is. And there's many ways you can do this. Some of them is by using gradients that you've collected in the past. Uh, some of them is using the fact that uh, uh, just say, well, let's just pretend H is diagonal. Uh, just to, there's a lot of things you can do to just play around this and not actually have to invert this matrix. Okay. So once you have this, you start it from H zero, it tells you which H star you can get uh, as a maximizer of the local quadratic approximation to your function. You can actually just iterate that, all right? So you start at some X zero somewhere. And then once you get to some XK, you just do the iteration which is described, which is just find XK plus one, which is the maximizer of the local quadratic approximation to your function at XK.
and repeat until convergence. OK, so if this was an optimization class, we would prove that convergence actually eventually happens for a uh, strictly concave function. Uh, this is a SAS class, so you're just going to have to trust me that this is the case. And uh, it's globally convergent, meaning that you can start wherever you want, and, uh, and it's going to work. And uh, uh, for under minor conditions on f. And in particular, those conditions are satisfied for the uh, log likelihood functions we have in mind. Okay? And it converges at an extremely fast rate. Usually, it's quadratic convergence, which means that every time you make one step, you improve the accuracy of your solution by two digits. Okay? Uh, if that's something you're vaguely interested in, I highly recommend that you take a class on nonlinear optimization. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. Of, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but it starts to in being more and more intertwined with high dimensional statistics and, uh, and machine learning. It's about the, uh, I mean, it's, it's an algorithms class typically, but it's very much um, uh, maybe more principled. It's not a bunch of algorithms that solve a bunch of problems. There's basically one basic idea, which is if I have a convex function, I can actually minimize it. If I have a convex fu concave function, I can maximize it. And there's, it evolves around similar things. All right, so let's stare at this iterative step for a second and pause and ask me, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so of course, in a second, we will plug in for the log likelihood. This is just a general thing for a general function f, but in a, in a second, f is gonna be ln. Okay, so if I wanted to implement that for real, I would have to compute the gradient of ln at a point xk, and I would have to compute the Hessian at a given point and invert it. Okay, so this is just the basic algorithm, and this, as, as you can tell, used in no place the fact that ln was the log likelihood associated to some canonical exponential family in a generalized linear model, right? This never showed up. So can we use that somehow? Uh, optimization for the longest time was about making your problems as general as possible, accumulating maybe in the interval point method theory and conic programming in the mid 90s. And now what optimization is doing is that it, now it's very general. It says, okay, if I want to start to go fast, I need to exploit as much structure about my problem as I can. And the beauty is that as statisticians or machine learning people, we do have a bunch of very specific problems that we want optimizers to solve and they can make things run much faster. But this did not require to wait until the 21st century problems with very specific structure arose already in the, this generalized linear model. So what do we know? Well, we know that this log likelihood is really one thing that comes when we're trying to replace an expectation by an average and then doing something fancy, right? That was our statistical hammer. And remember, when we introduced likelihood maximization, we just said, what we really want to do is to minimize the KL, right? That's the thing we wanted to minimize, the KL divergence between two distributions, the true one and the one that's parameterized by some unknown theta, and we're trying to minimize that over theta. And we said, well, I don't know what this is because it's an expectation with respect to some unknown distribution, so let me just replace the expectation with respect to my unknown distribution by an average over my data point. And that's how we justified the existence of the log likelihood maximization problem. But here, I actually, I might be able to compute this expectation at least partially where I need it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, since at a given point xk, say, let me call it here theta, I'm trying to find the inverse of the Hessian of my log likelihood, right? So if you look at the previous one, as I said, we're gonna have to compute the Hessian h sub ln of xk and then invert it, but let's forget about the inversion step for a second. We have to compute the Hessian. This is because we're trying, this is the Hessian of the function we're trying to minimize. But if I could actually replace it, not by the function I'm trying to minimize, to maximize, sorry, the log likelihood, but really by the function I wish I was actually minimizing, which is the KL, right? Then that would be really nice. And what happens is that since I'm actually trying to find this at a given xk, I can always pretend that this xk that I have in my current iteration is the true one and compute my expectation with respect to that guy. And what happens is that I know that when I compute the expectation of the Hessian of the log likelihood 
at a given theta, and then when I take the expectation with respect to the same theta, what I get out is negative Fisher information, right? The Fisher information was defined in two ways, as the expectation of the square of the derivative or the um, expectation, negative the expectation of the second derivative of the log likelihood. And so now I'm doing some sort of a leap of faith here because this theta, there's no way the theta, which is the current xk, that's the current theta at which I'm actually doing this optimization, I'm actually pretending that this is the right one. But uh, what's going to change by doing this is that it's going to make my life easier because when I take expectations, I tend to have, when I will see that when we look at the Hessian, it's, so the Hessian as essentially the derivative of, uh, say, a product is going to be the sum of two terms, right? The derivative of u times v is u prime v plus u v prime. One of those two terms is actually going to have expectations zero. And that's going to make my life very easy when I take expectations. I'm basically going to just have one term that's going to go away. And so in particular, my formula is just by the virtue of taking this expectation before inverting the Hessian is going to just shrink the size of my formulas by half. Okay, so let's see how this works. You don't have to believe me. Uh, is there any question about uh, this slide? You guys remember when we were doing maximum likelihood estimation and you know, Fisher information and the KL divergence, et cetera? Because that's what we're really trying to minimize. Mm. Yeah, so there's something you need to uh, trust me with, which is that the expectation of H of LN is actually H of the expectation of LN. All right? Yeah, it's true, right? So because the derivative, taking derivative is a linear operator. And we actually used that several times when we said expectation of second derivative, well, like actually expectation of uh, partial of L with respect to theta is equal to zero. Remember we did that? It's basically what we used, right? Yeah, so L the It's the log likelihood. Yeah. So actually, ln is typically not normalized. So I really should talk about ln over n, OK? But let's see that, OK? So if I have IID observations, that should be pretty obvious, OK? So if I have IID, say, x1, xn with density f theta, and if I look at log f theta of xi sum from i equal 1 to n. As I said, I need to actually have a 1 over n here. When I look at the expectation, they all have the same expectation, right? So this is actually indeed equal to um, negative kl plus a constant, OK? And negative kl is because this, if I, uh, sorry, if I look at the expectation. So the expectation of this guy is just the expectation of one of them. All right, so I just do expectation theta, OK? Agreed? The KL, remember the KL was expectation theta log F theta divided by F. Uh, so that's between P theta and P theta prime. And uh, that's, uh, well, no, sorry. That's the true P. And let's call it F, P theta, right? So that's, the, that's what showed up which is indeed equal to expect minus expectation theta log f theta plus log of f, which is just a constant with respect to theta. All right, this is the thing that's up there. It doesn't matter, OK? So this is uh, what shows up here. And just the fact that I have this 1 over n doesn't change because they're iid. Now, when I have things that are not iid, because what I really had was y1, yn, and yi at, at density f theta i, which is just the conditional density given xi, then I could still write this. And now when I look at the expectation of this guy, what I'm going to be left with is just 
1 over n sum from i equal 1 to n of the expectation of log f theta i of uh, y i. Okay? And it's basically the same thing except that I have a 1 over n expectation in front. And I didn't tell you this because I only showed you what the KL divergence was for between one, between two uh, distributions. But here I'm telling you what the KL uh, is between uh, two products of distributions that might that are independent but not necessarily identically distributed. Okay. But that's what's going to show up just because it's a product of things. So when you have the log, it's just going to be a sum. Other questions? All right. So what do we do here? Well, as I said now, we know that the uh, expectation of H is negative Fisher information. So rather than putting H inverse in my iterates for newton raphson I just should, I'm just gonna put the inverse Fisher information. And uh, remember I had a minus sign in front, so I'm just gonna pick up a plus sign now. Just because I is negative, the expectation of the, of the Hessian. And this guy has essentially the same uh, convergence properties, uh, and uh, it just happens that it's easier to compute I than HLN. And uh, that's it. That's really why you want to do this. Now, it, you might say that, well, if I use more information, uh, I should do better, right? But it's actually not necessarily true for several reasons, but uh, let's say that one is probably the fact that I did not use more information. Every step, when I was computing this thing at xk, I actually pretended that at theta k, the true distribution was the one distributed according to theta k. And that was not true. This is only true at when theta k becomes close to the true theta. And so, in a way, I, what I gained, I lost again by making this, uh, this thing. It's just really a matter of simple computation. So let's just see it on a particular example. Well, actually, on this example, it's not going to look much simpler. Uh, it's actually going to be the same. Um, all right, so I'm going to have the uh, Bernoulli example. All right, so we know that Bernoulli belongs to the canonical exponential family. And uh, essentially, all I need to tell you is what B is and B of theta for Bernoulli is log one plus E theta, right? We computed that, okay? And so when I look at my log likelihood, it's gonna look like the sum from I equal one to N of Y I of, okay, so here I'm gonna actually use the canonical length. So it's gonna be X I transpose beta minus log one plus exponential xi transpose beta. And phi for this guy is equal to one. Is it clear for everyone what I did? Okay, so this, remember the, the, the density, right? So that was really just, uh, so the PMF was exponential y theta minus log one plus e theta. There was actually no normalization. That's just the density of a Bernoulli. And uh, theta is actually log p over one minus p. And so that's what actually gives me what my, uh, uh, since p is the expectation, this is actually giving me also my canonical link, which is the log it link. We saw that last time. And so if I start taking the log of this guy and summing over n and replacing theta by xi transpose beta, which is the what the canonical link tells me to do, I get this guy. Is that clear for everyone? If it's not, please redo this step on your own. Okay. So I want to maximize this function, sorry. So I want to maximize this function over there on the first line as a function of beta. And so to do this, I want to use uh, either um, newton raphson or what I call Fisher scoring. So Fisher scoring is the second one when you replace the Hessian by negative Fisher information. All right, so I replace these two things. And so I first take the gradient. Okay, so let's take the gradient of Ln. Uh, 
So the gradient of ln is going to be, well, some. So here, this is of the form yi, which is a scalar, times a vector xi beta. That's what I erase from here. The derivative of b transpose x, the gradient of b transpose x is just b. So here I have just yi xi. Okay, so that's of the form yi, which is a scalar, times xi, which is a vector. Now what about this guy? Well, here I have a function, so I'm going to have just the usual rule, that the, the chain rule, right? So that's just going to be 1 over this guy. And then I need to find the Hessian of this thing. So the 1 is going away. And then I apply the chain rule again. So I get E of xi transpose beta, and then the Hessian of this thing, which is xi. So my Hessian, I can actually, my gradient, sorry, I can actually factor out to all my xi's and it's going to look like this. Hmm. My gradient is a weighted average or weighted sum of the xi's. This will always happen when you have a canonical, when you have a uh, generalized linear model. And that's pretty clear. Where did the xi show up? Whether it's from this guy or that guy, the xi came from the fact that when I take the gradient of xi transpose beta, I have this vector xi that comes out. And it's always going to be the thing that comes out. So I will always have something that looks like some sum with some weights here of the xi's. Now when I look at the second derivative, So same thing, I'm just going to take the derivative of this guy. Since nothing depends on beta here or here, I'm just going to have to take the derivative of this thing. And so it's going to be equal. So if I look now at uh, the Hessian ln as a function of beta, I'm going to have sum from i equal 1 to n of, well, yi. What is the derivative of yi with respect to beta? Zero, okay? It doesn't depend on beta. I mean, its distribution does, but y itself is just a, it's just a number, right? So uh, this is zero, so I'm going to get minus, and then I'm going to have, again, the chain rule that shows up. So I need to find the derivative of x over 1 plus x. What is the derivative of x over 1 plus x? So we don't even know. Uh, so it gives me... Uh, Okay, so that's 1 over 1 plus x squared. So that's minus e x i transpose beta, sorry, no, 1 divided by 1 plus e x i transpose beta squared times the derivative of the exponential, which is e x i transpose beta and again x i. And then I have this xi that shows up, but since I'm looking for a matrix, I'm going to have xi, xi transpose, right? Okay. So this is just, I know I'm going to need something that looks like a matrix in the end. And so one way you want to think about it is, you know, this is going to spit out an xi. There's already an xi here. So, I need to, so I'm going to have something that looks like xi, and I'm going to have to multiply by another vector xi. And I want it to form a matrix. And so what you need to do is to take an outer product. And that's it. All right. So now. As a result, <laughs> the updating rule is this. Honestly, this is not a result of anything. I actually rewrote everything that I had before with a theta replaced by beta because it's just painful to rewrite this entire thing, put some big parentheses, and put minus 1 here. Okay? And uh, then I would have to put the gradient, which is this thing here. 
So you, as you can imagine, this is not super nice. Um, actually, uh, what's interesting is, you know, at some point I mentioned those uh, pseudo-Newton um, method. They're actually doing exactly this. They're saying, oh, I'm actually, at each iterations, I'm actually gonna just take those guys. If I'm at iteration k, I'm actually just gonna sum those guys up to k rather than going all the way to n and look at every one. So you're just looking at your observations one at a time based on where you were before. Okay, so you know you have a matrix, you need to invert it. So if you want to be able to invert it, you need to make sure that the sum with those weights of xi outer xi or xi xi transpose is invertible. So that's a condition that you need to have. And uh, well, I mean, you don't have to because technically you don't need to invert, you just need to solve the linear system. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's actually guaranteed in most of the cases if n is large enough. All right, so everybody sees what we're doing here? Okay, so now that's for the um, newton raphson If I wanted to actually do the um, Fisher scoring, all I would need to do is to replace the Hessian here by its expectation when I pretend that the beta that I have at iteration k is the true one. What is the expectation of this thing? And when I say expectation, here I'm always talking about conditional expectation of y given x. The only distributions that matter, that have mattered in this entire chapter are conditional, ex uh, conditional expectation of y given x. The conditional expectation of this thing given x is what? It's itself. It does not depend on y. It only depends on the x's. So conditionally on x, this thing, as far as we're concerned, is completely deterministic. So it's actually equal to its expectation. And so in this particular example, there's no difference between Fisher scoring and uh, uh, newton raphson And the reason is because the gradient no longer depends on yi, uh, sorry, the Hessian no longer depends on, on yi, okay? So this slide is just repeating some stuff that I've said. Okay. So I think this is probably, um, well, okay, let's go through this actually. Um, at some point I said that uh, Newton Rapson, do you have a question? Not when you have a canonical link. Because the canonical link there is already in No. Uh, yeah, so, you know. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I wanted you to figure that out for yourself. But, uh, okay, so yi uh, times uh, xi transpose beta. So essentially, you know, when I have a general family, what he's referring to is that this is just b of xi transpose beta. So I'm gonna take some derivatives and there's gonna be something complicated coming out of this, but I'm certainly not gonna have some yi showing up. The only place where yi shows up is here. Now if I take two derivatives, this thing is gone because it's linear. So the first one is gonna keep only this guy and the second one is gonna make it gone. The only way this actually shows up is when I have an h here. And if I have an h, then I, I, t I can take second derivatives and this thing is not gonna be completely independent of uh, beta. Uh, sorry, yeah, this thing is still going to depend on beta, which means that this yi term is not going to disappear. I believe we'll see an example of that, or maybe I removed it. I'm not sure, actually. I think we, we will see an example of that. All right. So let us do uh, iteratively uh, reweighted least squares, or IRLS, which uh, I've actually recently learned is 
a term that even though it was defined in the 50s, people still feel free to use to define, to call their new algorithms, which have nothing to do with this. Uh, this is really something where you actually do iteratively reweighted least squares. Um, and so, which means that every step, okay, let's just actually go through this quickly. What is gonna be iteratively reweighted least squares? The way the steps that we had here showed up, let's say those guys, x star is this, is when we were actually solving this linear system, right? That was the linear system we were trying to solve. But solving a linear system can be done by just trying to minimize, right? If I have x, a, and b, it's the same as minimizing the norm of a, x minus b squared, right? Over x. Right, if I can actually find an x for which it's zero, it means that I've actually solved my problem. And so that means that this is actually, there's actually, I can solve linear systems by solving least squares problems. And least squares problems are things that statisticians are comfortable solving. And so all I have to do is to rephrase this as a least squares problem, okay? And you know, I could just write it directly like this, but there's a way to streamline it a little bit. And that's actually by using, uh, that's actually by using weights, okay? So I'll come in the weights in this, uh, uh, well, not today actually, uh, but uh, uh, very soon, all right? So this is just a reminder of what we had. We have that yi given xi as a distribution distributed according to some distribution in the canonical exponential family. So that means that the log likelihood looks like this. Again, this does not matter to us. This is the form that matters. And we have a bunch of relationships that we actually spent some time computing. The first one is that mu is b prime of theta i. The second one is that if I take g, g of mu i, I get this uh, systematic component, x i transpose beta, that's modeling. Now if I look at the derivative of mu i with respect to theta i, this is the derivative of b prime of theta i with respect to theta i, so that's the second derivative. And if, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call it v i, if phi is equal to one, this is actually the variance. And then I have uh, this function h which allows me to bypass altogether the existence of this parameter of mu, which says if I wanna go from xi transpose beta all the way to theta i, I have to first do g inverse and then b prime inverse. If I stopped here, I would just have mu, okay? Okay, so now if I, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply the chain rule and I'm gonna try to uh, compute the derivative of uh, my likelihood, log likelihood with respect to beta. So again, the, the log likelihood is much nicer when I write it as a function of theta than a function of beta, but it's basically what we've been doing by hand. You can write it as a derivative with respect to theta first and then multiply by the derivative of theta with respect to beta, okay? And we know that theta depends on beta as h of xi transpose beta, okay? I mean, that's basically what we've been doing for the, the Bernoulli case, which is I mean, we use the chain rule without actually saying it, but this is gonna be convenient to actually make it explicitly show up. Okay, so when I first take the derivative of my log likelihood with respect to theta, I'm gonna use the fact that my canonical family is super simple. Okay, so what I have is that my log likelihood L n is the sum from i equal one to n of y i theta i minus b of theta i divided by phi plus some constant, which I will, will go away as soon as I'm gonna take my first derivative. So if I take the derivative with respect to theta i uh, of this guy, this is actually gonna be equal to y i minus b prime theta i divided by phi. And then I need to multiply with the, with the, by the derivative of theta i with respect to beta. And remember, theta is h of x i transpose beta. So the derivative of theta i with respect to beta j, this is equal to h prime of x i transpose beta. And then I have uh, the derivative of this guy. Actually, let me just do the gradient of theta i at beta, right? That's what we did. I'm just calling theta i, I'm just thinking of theta i as being a function of theta. So what should I add here? Oh, it's just the vector xi, which is just the chain rule again. 
that's h prime, right? We don't see it, but there's a prime here, it's a derivative. Okay? We've done that without saying it explicitly. So now if I multiply those two things, I have this yi minus b prime of theta i, which I call by its good name, which is mu i. Right? b prime of theta i is the expectation of yi conditionally on xi. And then I multiply by this thing here. So here, this thing is written coordinate by coordinate, but I can write it as a big uh, vector when I stack them together. And so what I claim is that this thing here is of the form y minus mu, but here I put some tildes because what I did is that I first I, uh, I uh, uh, divided this, I multiply everything by g prime of mu for each mu, okay? So why not? Okay, so I uh, actually for on this slide, it will make no sense why I do this, right? I basically multiply by g prime on one side and divide by g prime on the other side. Okay, so what I write so far is that the, the gradient of ln, sorry, the gradient of ln with respect to beta is the sum from i equal 1 to n of yi minus mu i, let's call it, divided by phi times h prime of xi transpose beta xi. Okay, so I just stacked everything that's here. And now I'm going to start calling things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide so this guy here, I'm going to push here. Now this guy here, I'm actually going to multiply by g prime of mu i. And this guy, I'm going to divide by g prime of mu i. So there's really nothing that happened here. I just took g prime and multiply and divided by g prime. Why do I do this? Well, that's gonna actually going to be clear when we talk about uh, um, uh, iteratively reweighted least squares. But now, essentially, I have a new mu, a new uh, y, which is, so this thing now is going to be y tilde minus mu tilde, so i, i. Now, this guy here, I'm going to call w, i. And, uh, and uh, I have the uh, x i that's uh, there, which means that now the thing that I have here, I can write as follows, gradient ln of beta is equal to what? Well, I'm gonna write it in matrix forms. So I have the sum over i of something multiplied by x i. So I'm gonna write it as x transpose then I'm going to have this matrix w1, wn, and then 0 elsewhere. And then I'm going to have my y tilde minus mu. And remember, x is the matrix with, uh, sorry, it should be a bit narrow. I have n and then p. And here I have my x, i, j in this matrix on row i and column j. And uh, this is just the matrix that has the w i's on the diagonal. And then I have y tilde minus mu. So this is just the matrix for writing of this formula. All right, so it's just saying that if I look at the sum of weighted things of my columns of xi, it's basically the same thing, right? When I'm gonna multiply this by my matrix, I'm gonna get exactly those terms, right? Y i minus mu i tilde times w i. And then when I actually take this xi transpose times this guy, I'm really just getting the sum of the columns uh, uh, with, the, with the weights, right? Agreed? So if I look at this thing here, this is a vector that has as coordinate yi, a wi times yi tilde minus mu i tilde. And I have n of them. So when I multiply x transpose by this guy, I'm just looking at a weighted sum of the columns of x transpose, which is a weighted sum of the rows of x, which are exactly my x i's, right? And that's this weighted sum of the x i's. Okay, so here, as I said, the fact that we decided to put this g prime of mu i here and g prime of mu i here, we could have not done this, right? We could have just said, this I call, I don't even, for, I forget about the tilde, I just call it yi minus mu i. And here I just put everything I don't know into some wi. 
And so why do I do this? Well, it's because when I actually start looking at the Hessian, what's going to happen, uh, yeah, I will do that next time. But uh, let's just look quickly at the outcome of the computation of my Hessian. So I compute a bunch of second derivatives. And here I have two terms, right? Well, he's gone. All right, so I have two terms. And when I take the uh, expectation now, it's going to actually change, right? This thing is actually going to depend on yi because I have an h which is not the identity. Oh, no, you're here, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so when I start looking at the expectation, so I look at the conditional expectation given xi. The first term here has a yi minus its expectation. So when I take the conditional expectation, this is going to be 0. The first term is going away when I take the conditional expectation. But this was actually gone already if we had the canonical term because the second derivative of h, when h is the identity, is 0. But if h is not the identity, h prime prime may not be 0. And so I need that part to remove that term. And so now you know, I work a little bit and I get this term. That's not very surprising. In the second derivative, I see I have terms in b prime prime. I have term in h prime but squared. And then I have my xi outer xi, xi xi transpose, which we know we would see. OK, so we'll go through those things next time. But uh, what I wanted to show you is that now, uh, once I compute this, uh, I can actually show that if I look at this product that showed up, right? I had b prime prime times h, h prime squared. One of those terms is actually 1 over g prime. And so I can rewrite it as one of the h primes, because I had a square, divided by g prime. And now I have this xi, xi transpose. So if I, did not put the, if I did not put the g prime in the w that I put here, completely artificially, I would not be able to call this guy wi, which is exactly what it is from this board. And now that this guy is wi, I can actually write this thing here as x transpose wx. Okay, and that's why I really wanted my w to have this g prime of mu i in the denominator. Because now I can actually write a term that depends on w. Now you might say, how do I reconcile those two things? What the hell are you doing? And the, what the hell I'm doing is essentially that I'm saying that if you write beta k according to the Fisher scoring iteration, you can actually write it as just this term here which is of the form x transpose x inverse x transpose y, but where I actually squeezed in this w. And that's actually a weighted least squares, and it's applied to this particular guy. So we'll talk about those uh, weighted least squares. But remember, least squares is of the form x beta hat is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And here is basically the same thing, except that I squeeze in some w after my uh, x transpose. OK, so that's how we're going to solve it. Uh, I don't want to go into the details now, and uh, because mostly because we're running out of time. Are there any questions? 